Let us begin with uh, another brief prayer. Holy God, may the meditations of my heart, may the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable to you this day, our rock and our redeemer. In your holy name we pray. Amen. We have to start this challenging text from Amos with a caveat, which is that in the Bible there are multiple voices that bear testimony and bear witness to who God is and who we are and how we are called to be in this world. And the voices are not, do not speak as in unison. They're diverse in their nature. It's like a, a great chorus of voices and different with different parts and different tones within the chorus. In fact, maybe not even a chorus, but like a musical, because it's a, it's a narrative that begins in one place and, and goes to another place. And if you played all of the music and voices in a musical at the same time, it would just be a cacophony. But instead, what we do on Sunday morning is say, let's isolate a particular voice and see what that voice has to say to us this day. And so when we read Amos today, that's what we're doing. We're isolating one particular voice, which is very distinctive and has a very strong message and a very strong way of saying it. That's a long way of saying, don't shoot the messenger when I preach this sermon. <laughs> so Amos's message is about as clear as it can be. What he's saying is, God hates your worship services. God hates church. God hates all of us coming together to worship God. God hates my preaching. God hates the choir. God hates the organ. God hates all the things that we do. God hates our offerings. And Amos doesn't even use, use it's not even enough for Amos to say I, God hates it. He doubles down. He uses two words. I hate, I despise this, all of this stuff. It's like hate wasn't enough to say it. A Jewish scholar that I've, I listen to sometimes says, it's basically God is saying, your worship services make me want to puke. <laughs> okay, <laughs> so where do we go from there? Well, it is pretty clear in Amos that there's a reason, that God gives a reason for why God is so discontent with our worship services. And the reason is that we are not doing justice and living like we are supposed to live when we go out of this place. And so we go out of this place and we participate in injustice. We have prejudice and biases in our own heart that are unexamined. We go out into this place and we participate in systems in the world that are built upon injustice and we contribute to those. We do all of that stuff and then we come back in here and act like everything's okay. We come back in here and say, well, but we love God, so it's okay. I kind of imagine a movie scene, and I don't know if this is an actual movie scene, or it just should be a movie scene, but a mom is going to visit her serial killer son in prison, and they've just caught him, and it's just come to light that he's this terrible person who's done horrible things to all these people, and mom is just learning it as well, and so mom comes to visit him and says, son... Son, why, why'd you do all, I don't know why she talks like that, why'd you do all those things to those horrible people, son? And he said, oh, mama, I don't, I don't know about all that, but all I know is I love you, mama. Can you imagine? It's like, oh, great, I'm so glad that you love me <laughs> when I've just found out who you really are. Is this who I've raised you to be? I think that's how might be how God feels if we are out in the world participating in systems of injustice with unexamined prejudice in our heart, and we come in here and say, but God, we love you. So Amos is saying, you can't do that. Or God is very uncomfortable with that, to, say, to phrase it very lightly, to go out into the world and live one way, and then to come here and act like everything's okay. Now, we might say, hey, hey, Pastor Tom, you're being a little rough here. Maybe Amos is just talking to the really bad people. Amos is just talking to the real hypocrites, the, the corrupt politicians who wave Bibles around and then act like they're Christian, the corrupt CEOs who mistreat their workers and then give to charity as if that makes it okay and they do that in a public way, or the corrupt preachers 
who preach one way about grace and generosity, but then they're just raking in all that money and keeping it for themselves. Maybe that's what God is upset about, that level of injustice. Except there's a part of this passage which implicates all of us regular folk as well. And it comes in 18, 19, and 20. In that passage, Amos says, You who wish for the day of the Lord, why do you wish for the day of the Lord? You think it's going to be good for you, but it's not. Now, the day of the Lord, this may be the earliest reference to that concept in the entire Bible. Amos was probably preaching around 850 BCE, and even the book of Genesis was probably written after that. So this may be the first reference to the day of the Lord, but it won't be the last. The day of the Lord is just what you think it is. It's a judgment day. It's a day when God comes and says, we're going to settle accounts. And the way that people have been living, we're going to settle accounts for that. Those who have benefited from greed and from injustice, they're going to be punished. And those who have been harmed and oppressed for all of this time, they will be rewarded. There will be a great reconciliation and a great reversal. That's the idea of Judgment Day. Now, in our modern times, we can think about people who are wishing for the day of the Lord. We can think about evangelical Christians that we may have heard of that are hoping for the return of Christ because they know it's going to be good for them. They know when Jesus comes back, they believe in Jesus, they're washed in the blood, everything's okay, and all those other people who haven't accepted Christ are in trouble. Isn't that exactly what Amos is talking about? You who wish for the day of the Lord, why do you wish? It's like they're completely oblivious and unconscious about what God really wants from them. Not a particular confession of faith, but a particular way to live. Are we that different? Are we in this room that different as Reformed Christians who, yes, we talk about our own sin, we, we uh, rely entirely upon the grace of God, but in the end, we think we're going to be okay. Maybe not on the judgment day, but maybe when we die and go to heaven, we're going to go to heaven and it's going to be good because God is gracious and loving and infinite love and all that stuff. But are we not then also those same people who are unconscious of our biases, unconscious of our prejudice, unconscious of the, that the way we live in this world may be more important to God than what we believe. That the way we live and the justice that we do within our own lives and within the systems of this world is more important to God than what we do here on Sunday morning. Whether we have the right kind of music or the right kind of instruments or the right order of worship, that it's not, it's not how we worship, it's the hearts that we bring into worship with us. Now, Amos does offer us a way forward. He doesn't just leave us here in this horrible spot of God despising us and hating us. And it's in that last line, that last line that Martin Luther King Jr. made so famous when he spoke on the Washington Mall in front of the Lincoln Memorial. And he said, let justice roll down like waters and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. But listen to that metaphor. Listen to what it means. Rushing and rolling water is not a trickling stream. Rushing and rolling water is powerful. It's destructive. Imagine yourself sitting by a waterfall or standing by a waterfall, one of those ones with so much water rushing over it that it makes you nervous, that it makes you scared that if I slip here and I fall in, I'm dead. I'm a goner. I'm going to be crushed by this massive amount of water. That's what God is saying when God says, let justice roll down like water. And that water can be something that washes all kinds of things away. It can wash away our own prejudice. It can wash away our, our own discrimination of others. It can wash away our own fears. It can wash away everything that helps us build the unjust systems of this world. And it can then also wash away those systems and those structures and everything that we've built that has created this world that we live in that is so unjust, so upside down and so backwards. Those rolling and rushing waters have the power to do just that. But we then must have a vision for that kind of outcome. 
maybe part of what we need to do when we come to worship, maybe what Amos is telling us is that we're not dreaming big enough, that our vision is not great enough, that when we come here, we're not just hoping for gradual change. We're not just hoping that things will mostly stay the same, but everything will be a little bit better for everybody. We're hoping for a complete reversal. We're envisioning the water rushing down and crashing away everything from the structures of our hearts to the structures of society that are unjust and making room for something entirely new. We come to worship not hoping that maybe we'll live a little better, but that we will have a radical change in the way we live and the way the world operates. We have these unconscious biases. We think the things that we don't even know that we don't know. And we are called to look to have an open heart and an open mind and examine our hearts and souls for just those kinds of things that maybe we didn't even know we had. The things that we have to listen to others and say, oh, I didn't even know that that's what I was saying, but now I see how you're hearing it. Are we advocating for the policies in this world that really have radical change? You know, we hear a lot about abolish the police, and people say, oh, no, that's too far. How, how can we say that? You're gonna, that's, a losing, that's a losing slogan. And maybe it is in the political world. But in God's world, that's exactly the vision that we're looking for. We're looking for a world without police. We're looking for a world where justice and safety are not enforced at the, bar at the end of the barrel of a gun. We're looking for a world where people are supported enough in the world where everybody has enough so that crime is rare. We don't need a militarized police force because there are so many programs in this world that allow everybody to have enough and everybody to thrive. That there's no reason. Everybody has a job. Everybody has clean water. Everybody has enough healthy food. Everybody has medical care. That's the vision that Amos calls us toward. That's the vision that rolling and rushing and pounding waters create. And then at the end of that verse, let righteousness flow like an ever-flowing stream. That's what happens at the bottom of the waterfall. That's what happens after everything is turned over and upside down and smashed and crushed. This is a movie scene in The Lord of the Rings when Frodo is fleeing the what a ring wraiths, these awful dark demon kind of things, and has to get into the elf, the magical elfin land, right, where he'll be safe. They cross over a river, and it's a, a gentle flowing river, and they, they're going across, they're going across, and then they turn around, and the, as the ring wraiths come at them with their menacing swords, the elf, I forget what her name is, Erwin? Any? Hmm? No, not Gandalf, the elfin woman. Arwen. Okay, thank you. Lord of the Rings geeks, yes, <laughs> unite. Um, <laughs> and she calls on the water, and it becomes, instead of a gentle stream, it comes this rolling, rushing, pounding flood. And, and, and with, with CGI magic, they make these horses, like there's horses at the beginning of this flood that just wash away these evil demons. And then at the end, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to jump scenes. You Lord of the Rings geeks are going to get me for this. Then there's another scene... <laughs> where Aragon is floating in the water after a terrible fall. That's the gentle flowing stream that comes after the crushing flood. That's the time when we have, when we've been humbled by God's power to step onto the shore into a completely new, changed, different life, both for us and for others. And so the second piece of how we come to worship, that we come with a radical vision and we come with completely humbled hearts. We come knowing that we do not have it right, that we're not ready for the day of the Lord. Please, God, give us a little more time to work on this, that we need that radical transformation for us as well as for the world. Let justice roll down like waters and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. There's other passages in the Bible that tell us that we need to be in church and worshiping God all the time, that tell us that we are commanded to worship, that say, make a joyful noise to the Lord all the earth, that say the Holy Spirit is at work within us when we worship together. Amos has a unique voice. Let radical justice guide every decision we make from the time we walk into this door to the time we leave. 
and let humble hearts guide us as we move through this service, being open to that cleansing, crushing spirit that gives us the opportunity to then step out as new creations on solid ground. Amen.